Okay, so we've talked about how technology and apps like WhatsApp have affected communications about health in many of the episodes in this podcast. But do you know the extent of it? So WhatsApp actually became one of the most important digital technologies in India. And so that really changed Transnational Care Collective's dynamics quite a bit. And yeah, when it comes to frequent calling, and most people would be calling their parents every day or twice a day or sometimes 20 times a day, like just having these very short, brief conversations. Hi, I'm Dr. Raj Sundar, a family physician and a community organizer. You're listening to Healthcare for Humans, the show dedicated to educating you on how to care for culturally diverse communities so you can be a better healer. This is about everything that you wish you knew to really care for the person in front of you not just a body system. Let's learn together. Welcome back, everyone. I'm thrilled to have you here again today. Today, we're going to talk about care, that word that is fundamentally a part of healthcare. How often do we in healthcare exclusively view care as something provided by a healthcare professional to a patient? If you've done this work long enough, you know care is more than just clinical interactions. It extends to the unspoken bonds within families and the tools and technology that facilitate care, like a simple wheelchair. We've had patient, community, and historian perspective in this podcast before. And I've also wanted a research and analytical perspective to some of the concepts we've talked about. So today, joining us is Tanya Alin, a researcher and anthropologist who has dedicated her career to understanding care practices across diverse contexts. And it's going to help us broaden our definition of what care means. And as we define and explore care, we'll relate it to chronic illness and its role within something called care collectives, where people worldwide care for each other through technology. You've probably encountered this with your patients, because I have. Patients bringing advice from their family members abroad through texts, WeChat and WhatsApp messages, you name it, they've used it. Often these interactions are dismissed, but they're integral to the care collective we're discussing today. In a world where many family members span different continents, technology is the bridge connecting them and helps them care for each other. We need to take it seriously. I hope this helps you understand the concepts of care a bit better, and it gives you a new perspective on engaging the so called care collectives. We're going to break this episode into two parts. This is part one, and here's Tanya. Okay. Welcome to the show, Tanya. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on today to talk about specifically about technology. It's come up in some of our other episodes, the idea of technology being an important part of care. I know you have a book coming out. We'll talk about the book a little later in this episode. I saw some chapters from the book. I would love to start this conversation talking about care and the definition of care, because I think people who are listening to this podcast and many people have a very narrow definition of care. Tell me what care means to you and how you would define it. I think that care is really a concept that is very slippery. I think commonly care is understood in terms of work, as in caring for somebody, or in terms of emotion, so as in caring about somebody. And that's also how it's discussed by care ethicists, like people like Joe Toronto, for example. Such definitions assume that care is something that involves only people, so caregivers and care receivers. And in fact, John Trollope really says that care is a distinctly human characteristic. So it's something that defines people. But then there are also different approaches to care. The one that I base my research on is called care in practice or care as practice. So that's an approach that's developed by science and technology scholars of care, like Jeanette Pauls and Anne-Marie Moll. And in this trend, Care is defined as something that people enact through specific practices like bathing or calling or feeding and so on. So they enact care together, not only with other people, but also with material things like ICU beds or money or digital technologies, and also with institutions and words and so on. So what is care 
really depends on the philosophical approach that you take to it. Let's make this concrete. Give me some examples. I know you use some examples in the book, because when we think about care from a healthcare context, I think we narrowly define it as a healthcare professional giving something to a patient or somebody who's seeking care. There's an inherent, as you said, a receiver and a somebody who's giving care. So there's that power dynamic. I think we do acknowledge that's not the only type of care we get. We do acknowledge that care is received at home by people, but I don't think we think about the whole context of care. And I think that's what you're mentioning there. You used an example of ICU beds. Let's use that example again. So I usually use this example to explain how material things are involved in shape care, actually. So if you think of a person who is sick, they have a fever, they're not feeling well, they're at home in their bed, and the only kind of technology they have there is a thermometer and maybe some paracetamol and very little technologies around, right? And then every once in a while, a family member comes by and asks, how are you doing? And so on. And then eventually, if things get worse, the person is transported to the hospital into an ICU bed, right? And that bed is very different. It involves all kinds of technologies, monitors, things I have no idea about. Now, that kind of a bed requires very different knowledge to manage. It requires healthcare professionals with very specific skills to manage the bed. And during COVID, there were sometimes even enough ICU beds in the hospitals, but there maybe were not enough healthcare professionals that could operate those beds, right? This example gives you an idea of how important the material things are when it comes to, to health, how to provide what kind of care. And it can make the difference between life and death, literally. That's why I think that it's really important to pay attention not only to people who are caring, but also to the material factors around. And you were mentioning this distinction between the formal and informal care. Now, of course, this difference between this kind of cares runs along the lines of place and professionalization and funding also, right? Because... Formal care is something, as you said, that is done in healthcare institutions and it's done by professional healthcare workers. And it's also paid through formal channels like health insurance. But informal care is typically done at home, is done by non-trained carers, especially family members, and it's not paid or it's paid very little. So in my work, I actually try to go beyond this distinction and show how this everyday little act that we don't usually consider care can actually be really significant when it comes to health as well. So just to give you an example, my study is basically around India where adult children live abroad for work. So they have migrated abroad and then they take care of their aging parents who are still in India. So somebody that I talked to, a son, Mm -hmm. told me how Every once in a while, he returned back to Kerala, not just to visit his parents, but also to visit his friends. And then say they would have a drink together. They would have a little party. And normally we wouldn't think of that as taking care of the parents, right? But it turned out in his case that it was really crucial for his father's health because when his father became sick with COVID, he needed a bed in the hospital. And one of the friends from these parties was actually essential in helping to bring the father into the hospital. And this is the kind of work that is really invisible when it comes to care, but is actually essential. Yeah, care happens in community. I also note the idea of care can be informal and at home. I'm going to keep talking about that because it is very undervalued, especially in the U.S., We have a horrible family medical leave, especially after you have a baby or if somebody's ill. Depending on what state you live, sometimes you get paid. But there's a lot of free labor, quote unquote, with the context of professionalization of Mm -hmm. care that happens at home, especially, I think, disproportionately often on women, which can affect the wage gap and the gender gap as well. The other example that I thought was helpful in clarifying care 
was the wheelchair example that you used. Because we talked about ICU beds as how at home we have a regular bed and then a patient gets sick enough that they go into the ICU. Now they're in a specialized bed in a center and the caregiver often loses all their power and the care receiver now becomes part of the institution. And they're trying to fit this new role of not understanding any of the technology and being reliant on the clinicians, the therapists who are coming in the room for care, when sometimes the family has been doing that for a long time for the person. And I don't think we incorporate them into the team very well. And the second analogy, I'm going to come back to this, is the wheelchair analogy that you're talking about, how in that context, the care, we often think of the care receiver as somebody who is disabled in a wheelchair and the caregiver as somebody who's helping transport them. But I think for you, you had redefined how the care receiver also interacts in that situation, right? And what does that mean to you? The example of the wheelchair actually comes from work done by Miriam Winons, who is a French social scientist, and is a wonderful example of how care can be actually distributed among different people. So she worked within disability studies. And when it comes to people with different kinds of disabilities, usually there is this power asymmetry, right? So the person who gives care has more power than the person who receives care. But by making visible the wheelchair, this power becomes more distributed. It's not exactly equal position, but the thing is that the wheelchair has to be adjusted not only to the person who sits in the wheelchair, but also to the person who pushes the wheelchair. And that's the idea of tinkering as well. So when a new chair is introduced to the care receiver and caregiver, it has to be set up. It has to be tinkered with. So it has to be moved a little bit up and down. The headset has to be moved. The arm rests have to be moved a little bit and so on. But they have to be adjusted to both. And in that sense, this relationship between caregivers and the care receivers is a little bit more symmetric, if not the same. This example highlights the importance of, again, the material actor within this relationship. So this is also where the example of the notion of care collective comes from. And in my work, I build on that notion and bring it into a new context. Thank you. We're going to keep building on the context. I know we're talking about other people's work. So thank you for helping us out here. So we talked about care. We talked about some of the material objects like beds and how that can transform how care is received, like formal versus informal. Now we talked about how even at home, there's an interesting dynamic between the person who's receiving care, person who's giving care. The next concept that I want to build on is the idea of chronic illness. I think in The Body Multiple, which was 2002. But can you tell us what she talks about in that, the concept of defining chronic illness? Yeah, so the way I use chronic illness, building on Mm -hmm. her, is actually not so much about defining chronic illness as such, but it's about Mm. using it to talk about what good care is. Now, when it comes to good care, often we think there should be some norms We have some ideas about what good care is and should be and so on. But when it comes to the theoretical approach that I use, and I'm Marimol as well, good care is not about following certain norms, but it's again about trying to find out and tinkering with different situations and different settings to discover what good care is for a specific person within a specific situation And so what good care is for whom, when, and why. And chronic illness here is useful to think with because when it comes to chronic illness, there's no such thing as looking for cure. So when it comes to illness in general, good care is about finding the cure, curing the illness, right? And then when that is done, care was good. So that's the idea. But with chronic illness, it's more complicated. Because there's no cure, at least not for the time being, maybe there will be in the future, but for the time being, a person with chronic illness just has to live with it and has to live with it in a way that is as good as possible. 
Mm -hmm. And then sometimes people also fail at doing this, right? So it's not that this is something that is always possible to achieve, but it's really about this tinkering and about being reminded that good care is continuously and always locally enacted through tinkering with people, but also things, technologies, institutions, and so on. I wanted to contrast that with what good care means. Let's talk about chronic illnesses like diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, or hypertension. Mm -hmm. For healthcare systems, good care means meeting our goals, right? So for diabetes, it's A1C, which is the average blood glucose in three months, having that well controlled, making sure you are getting the care for preventive care for diabetes, which is getting digital retinal screening, making sure we do a foot check to make sure you don't have any neuropathy or nerve problems, and making sure you get your labs every six months to a year. Those are the metrics we use. I think we rigidly follow that sometime. I wanted to contrast that with what you're saying, where care for chronic illness is so much more than these outcomes, because care doesn't sometimes have a specific outcome, but I think healthcare systems have defined mm -hmm. it. And we either fail or succeed according to these metrics we've established mm -hmm. for it. But for a patient who's living with diabetes, high blood pressure, this is not their goal. And I think it's worth saying that even if subconsciously or at some point healthcare systems understood that, the way it's operationalized and implemented is following these mm -hmm. metrics. I think this is especially confusing for immigrant asylum refugee communities, which we're talking about in this podcast mm -hmm. at this time. Because it's confusing, right? For them, care is this very human aspect of illness, of having a community and people helping them with medicines and making sure they feel subjectively okay to do the things that they want. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And the whole empirical ethics approach was basically a reaction to these norms that are set by healthcare professionals or within the healthcare sector to achieve good care. So there's this idea that within the healthcare sector, there should be certain norms that are according to which one can find out or establish whether good care has been achieved or not. But then when people like Jeanette Pauls and Dick Willems here, they're based in Amsterdam in the Netherlands, they were looking at what actually then happens in the healthcare setting. And they found out that sometimes these norms are just not possible to follow. So that's how they came up with this idea of empirical ethics, which is all about, let's try to see what is good within specific practices. And so how certain things have to be adjusted because the metrics maybe don't always make sense or cannot be achieved, but maybe sometimes even if certain metrics are not achieved, that doesn't mean that the person is not feeling well. And that's where the idea of empirical ethics comes from, because you have to try out what good is through practice, through trying out. When I think about empirical ethics, for me, what makes sense is for diabetes, I care about this metric of A1C control, controlling the blood sugars. For that, let's say I want to give somebody insulin mm -hmm. so they have to administer it. I think from a patient's perspective, the practice of giving insulin is just as important as achieving the A1C goal of how easy is it to administer, how much of a nuisance it is for them in their daily lives, depending on something like an insulin, who else is helping them with, if they have fear of needles, how do you grapple with that fear every day when they're giving themselves insulin, and how is family helping them? I think all of that can also be part of the definition of good care. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I think the role of healthcare systems is a bit unclear on how we're supposed to help with that good care, because I think we've said good care for us means we diagnose, we treat, and then leave it to the patient and family to define what care looks like in their household. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that can feel overwhelming because we actually defer a lot of care to the person or the household. Mm -hmm. And that interface of more and more technology, we are giving to the family. Tell me if I'm again going off the rails here, but we'll use the example of insulin mm -hmm. again, where 
administration of insulin is a skill. Mm. And we teach it to the patient. And then we expect them to do it. It's a learnable skill. People who have type 1 diabetes live with this for a long time and are often better at knowing their body than their healthcare professionals or the healthcare team. But when it gets complicated is as people get older, people get dementia, if they don't have family around, we still offload or ask the patient to define what good care means for them and receive it. And we abdicate our responsibility to go into that space of helping that patient receive good care. So I think there's a separation here that I struggle with because I want healthcare systems to be caring and kind. I don't think many healthcare systems look at themselves as that's the role they have in health. The next concept that I wanted to bring in is the transnational care collective. Transnational care collectives are really what I call these global assemblages of people and technologies through which care is enacted through specific practices such as frequent calling and also spending time together on the webcam or sharing everydayness on the phone. And transnational refers to transnational families. And those are families where family members live all around the world in different countries. But actually, you could use the same concept to refer to families that live within the same country, but separated by geographic distance. So the U.S. is huge, right? So you would have national care collectives there. Just to give you an example, so in India, good elder care is pretty closely associated with physical proximity. Specifically, it's about intergenerational co-residence. So the parents should live together with one of their sons and his wife, right? But when adult children migrate abroad for work, of course, that kind of care is not possible anymore. So there is this uh, huge course of discourse of abandonment, which actually when children migrate abroad, they actually abandon their parents because they're not physically together anymore. They cannot live with them. They cannot cook for them. They cannot bathe for them and so on. But what I found in my research is that in such families, people don't care less because they don't live together, but they start to take care differently. And that includes working with digital technologies. Transnational care collectives form because people tinker with different kinds of digital technologies. So with mobile phones, smartphones, and webcams, and so on, to find out how they can continue taking care of each other, even across geographic distance. In a way, it's an attempt to reconceptualize the meaning and the practice of care when living together is not an option, or at least it's not the best option for everyone. A concept that helped me understand both the care collective and transnational care collective is the idea of co-presence mm-hmm. and the way that co-presence can facilitate and close the gap of the physical distance. Mm-hmm. Because I'm Indian. And there, I think of many people who hold the Asian American identity. Mm -hmm. We have concepts and values that are historical, now subconscious, still part of our culture that informs multi-generational households. One, that we care for our elders. And that if you dig into Chinese culture specifically, there is a belief that children care for their elders. Two, that when... Our elders get sick, we're readily available because they have taken care of us for so long that now we should take care of them when able. I think that's become hard for so many reasons, right? Because the norm nowadays is that many families are apart. They're not in close proximity as before. And that's true for my family too. My late grandparents, they were in India and then my parents moved here. And then now I'm in Seattle, Washington. And my parents are in the East Coast. So you can imagine the different amounts of distance between me and my family, and then my family in India, and then between my parents and their family. This is the next question, the physical distance. So for transnational care collectives to function, we need technology. Right. You talk about technology in a specific way, because when I talk about technology in healthcare, people are thinking about innovation. Mm -hmm. And I think you have a personal story with this. Technology isn't the next Silicon Valley 
invention to make care more accessible for patients who are wanting it. Technology is something different for you in these transnational care collective. What does it mean for you? My whole work was actually a reaction to highly specialized, innovative technologies that were being introduced into healthcare and are still being introduced, actually. More than a decade ago, I had this opportunity to sit in a meeting with there were people from academia and people from the industry and people from the government, and they were trying to come up with an idea for a national telemedicine system. And there was a lot of talk about the technology and the funding, but there were almost no talk about the people that would actually have to use this kind of technology, the nurses, the doctors, the patients. And I was really shocked by that. I was shocked by this top-down approach of implementing technologies in healthcare. And I found by going to conferences that this was quite symptomatic. And then at the same time that a lot of these telemedicine projects were deemed very successful at the pilot stage, and then they were not implemented very well beyond that. And somebody was talking about pilotitis as a chronic condition of telemedicine. So being this constantly stuck in the pilot stage. And my whole research was a reaction to that as well, because I was looking and said, what if we go into the other direction and we actually look at the technologies that are already out there and more or less easily available and accessible for a majority of people, if not everyone. And so I decided to look at everyday digital technologies like mobile phones, webcams, and now smartphones. And uh, I found that indeed they support family care at a distance, and that can include also taking care of health specifically at a distance. And also one important thing that I learned from this is that, and that I really want to emphasize, is that it's really difficult to do research with digital technologies for the fact that we take them for granted now. They're so ingrained into our everyday life that we barely notice them. I think this is really something to pay attention to because what I aim to show with my work is that this kind of technologies can actually really importantly shape how we relate to other people, how we care for other people, what care is, and actually who we are. So that's something to pay attention to. These are not just the tools that we use for the purposes of communication, for example, but they do something to us. They do something to how we think, how we are in the world, and how we relate to other people. And I think those are really very subtle things that are worth paying attention to, especially because they're becoming more and more prominent in every aspect of our life. Yeah, as the presence of technology becomes, I'll say, omnipresent, I think its effect on us as humans is becoming more obvious in how we live our world. It's the classic example of you go outside and everybody's looking down on a screen when they're walking. Yes, exactly. Right? Nobody's actually looking up at you. But what you're talking about, I think it's important to call out, which is when we talk about technology and transnational care collectives, it's not innovative technology. It's not Alexa, Apple Watch, or some new technology that can help track your steps, make you take medicine. But you're talking about phone calls. Exactly. It's app, which actually is becoming like text mm-hmm. texting for many mm-hmm. folks. Or WeChat. Those are probably the big apps that I see, especially in my immigrant patients, where they're communicating with their families mm-hmm. through that. So with those technologies, let's talk about a few examples of what care can look like. Sure. One of the within care collectives, what I found was that there are different kinds of care practices that emerge. I do have to say that one of them is sending money home as well. So the the whole economy of remittances is very important because it gives rise to transnational care collectives. If it wasn't for money, then maybe the transnational care collectives wouldn't even exist in this specific group that I work with. But also a major care practice, even more important than money, was actually calling one's parents frequently. And a male nurse, for example, told me that for him, care was not about money and it was not also about saying, mom, dad, I love you and I care for you and things like that. But it was really very much the practical act 
of picking up the phone and calling every day. And they would be talking for five or 10 minutes every day about what, what was going on, about the details of their everyday life. And they shared things with him. He shared things with them. And that for him was the most important practice of care. And now, of course, you might wonder what frequent is, right? And I found that in every family, in every transnational care collective, the dynamic was a bit different. And that depended on who among the family members was involved, who among the siblings were involved, and to what degree, or maybe that changed through time or through people's health condition as well. It also changed based on which kind of technologies they used. So at the beginning of my research, that was in 2014 and 15, the older people in India used mostly very simple mobile phones. But the end of my research, which was in 2022, I did my final follow-up interviews. The older people in India were using WhatsApp a lot. So WhatsApp actually became one of the most important technologies, digital technologies in India. And so that really changed transnational care collectives dynamics quite a bit. And yeah, when it comes to frequent calling, and most people would be calling their parents every day or twice a day or sometimes 20 times a day, like just having these very short, brief conversations. They would be going shopping together and asking, I'm buying this. <laughs> what do you think about this color or that color and so on? And some people would say, but these are really silly things. These are just like very trivial exchanges. They're not important. But what I found out was that they were actually crucial. Because it was not about the details themselves. It was about the sharing of the everyday life. And on the phone, how do you do that? You have to talk. It's very, it's very uncomfortable if you're silent on the phone. It's, so that's another thing that I want to mention is that there's no such thing as technology. There are only specific technologies. And each of them affords us with very different things. And yes, on the phone, it's uh, uncomfortable to be silent. So people would really be describing their garden or their animals or the neighbor's animals and the neighbor's children and how the church was and all that. But this was really a way of being together at the distance on the phone. And then again, on the webcam, that would be something else. I agree. I think there's a form of care, which is all about connection which is this either a ritualized connection. I think we talk about ritualized co-presence in the writing. The idea of, hey, I call them every day. I call them whenever I go shopping. And that's how we connect. There's this other idea of omnipresent co-presence, which is, hey, we're going to do our life together. I'll say examples that come to my mind is my dad used to call my grandmother every day on his drive to work. That's just what he did. And that's the way they connected. And for the omnipresent co-presence, it's how my sons, who are two and a half and 16 months old, they call my parents, who are in the East Coast, during dinner time. They're not talking about anything, really. <laughs> Nothing important. But he's eating his dinner, and he's asking my dad to read him books. And then they hang out. My mom just sits there because, you know, my kids run around, and sometimes they're not even on the screen, and then they come back on. So it's like... You're facilitating this idea of co-presence almost as if you're there. Important to point out, as if. Exactly. And I think you call this too. You can never replace the actual physical presence. Mm -hmm. But this is as close as it gets as people try to find that connection. I think all these ways of connecting are especially important because of the epidemic of social isolation and loneliness. We, I don't think we acknowledge how important these connections can be. And to note that and elicit that and maybe cultivate it in our communities that have families all over the world, which is true for immigrant, refugee, and asylum communities, but it's true for many people right now. Yeah, exactly. Thanks again, everyone, for joining me on another episode of Healthcare for Humans. If you liked this episode, as always, my ask to you is please share it with one other person and go to healthcareforhumans.org to sign up to be part of the community. And lastly, thank you to Tessa Chu and Maharazaki for supporting this podcast, making sure it's the best it can be, and helping with the creation and the production of all parts of this podcast. Thanks again. I'll see you next time.